Hello, and welcome back to Erasing Data for Good. This is a webinar series designed to provide you with a solid understanding of data erasure best practices in four easy to digest episodes. This is episode two. If you missed episode one, it's available on demand right now, uh, and you can find the link right there on your webinar console under the tagline, more in this series. There's a button for you. Um, my name is John Mellon. I'm the president of Blanco Technology Group, and I am delighted to be your host for today's episode. Uh, today, we're turning our attention to security and compliance. Some might say security and compliance are the, are the two main drivers for implementing a data sanitization policy. And of course, this is what we have uh, found to be the case in the poll result, results from our last episode. Joining me today, uh, if I had a drum, I'd do a drum roll, are two stalwarts of the cybersecurity community. Uh, Jim Alco is a well-known name in the industry. Uh, and we'll start with Jim. Jim, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and, and your experience? Sure, thanks, John. Thanks for having me today. Um, I'm Jim Alcove. I'm currently the chief executive officer at a small cybersecurity startup focused on reinventing the future of access control. Uh, but previously, I've had the pleasure of working at some of the world's uh, 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 largest and uh, 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 incredible uh, technology companies, including Salesforce, uh, most recently, where I was the chief trust officer uh, prior to that at Google, where I led product engineering and security for a division of Google called Nest that makes uh, smart home uh, devices. And then previously, I, I was at Microsoft for 17 years uh, uh, with a variety of roles, including um, leading commercial windows, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, and security for windows. That was my last job there. Well, Jim, welcome, a big welcome on behalf of uh, all the attendees and uh, uh, Blanco as, as well. We're really, really looking forward to you being a part of this, uh, this important webinar. Uh, and not to be outdone, uh, my friend Mar Maurice Uenema, uh, Maurice, uh, my friend, please introduce yourself to the to the audience. Yeah, certainly. Hi, everyone. Maurice Uenema here. Uh, security has been a uh, personal, professional passion and focus for much of my life, from my uh, academic uh, training and education at the Naval Academy and Graduate School to my uh, service as a Marine Corps officer for approximately a decade before transitioning to the IT uh, services space, working at the Pro Systems and Dell. I was a Vice President at the Center for Internet Security before transitioning into uh, security uh, software company Tripwire before moving here to Blanco. Uh, I currently manage our North America business. Thanks, Maurice and Jim. Uh, before we dive into the content, I'll let you know that you can submit questions directly to our panel. Uh, we'll either answer live if time allows or get back to you individually uh, after the show. You can also use the live chat function to share thoughts on the topics we'll discuss today. So listen, when we hear uh, about data security, we, we, we're often talking about protecting the systems that are used to process uh, uh, and communicate data. Uh, either, you know, uh, as it relates to perimeter defenses, network monitoring, uh, multi-factor uh, authentication, zero trust uh, policies, et cetera. These are all kind of front and center in the security space. But today, you know, let's shift a little bit toward this uh, act and uh, profession and best practices around data sanitization or data erasure. Um, the industry has is, is emphasized that these are primarily driven by regulations, uh, industry best practices. And we want to kind of dr d drill into what makes permanently deleting data so important. And we'll start uh, with, with Jim. Jim, uh, you've helped us understand in preparation for this webinar, and certainly as we've served you in a multitude of businesses, the importance of, of data lifecycle hygiene. Could you pro provide a little bit of context around that for our audience, and, and maybe we can start uh, drilling into the, the paths to try and uh, build a solid governance uh, infrastructure and framework for the purposes of, of starting to win in this this uh, whole environment. Sure, uh, you know I think that you know when it comes to information security, I, I'm a big believer in hygiene. Hygiene is a is is one of the most important things any of us can do to protect protect information and protect our businesses and customers. And I think that you know that involves you know simple things like multi-factor authentication and patching your systems. 
Well, when you think about data, data has a similar set of hygiene uh, aspects that you need to think about as, as you think about the entire sort of life cycle from start to finish of data, um, starting from you know when you're ingesting that data, collecting it from a user and, and classification and cataloging, and then a whole series of protection steps in the middle, you know, encryption at rest and in transit and access control, ensuring that people have just the right access at the right time for the right duration. And then ultimately, as that as your business's utility for that data decreases or goes away, you have an obligation to destroy that data and, and, and to protect the, the original owner of that data, the end consumer or the business that's your customer. And it's a critical part of the overall uh, security uh, program at a company, but it's also a, a key sort of end end stage of the of the data lifecycle um, that's becoming much much more important in companies today. And, and you you had commented uh, about how uh, daunting this uh, uh, GDPR matter has been for many companies, and the fact that uh, data sanitization and erasure ended up being one of the most difficult things to really institutionalize. Why do you think that that is? Well, I think it, you know as as big data systems have evolved. You know, we collect more and more data uh, uh, about about consumers, about our businesses, to make decisions, to make our services better. All of which is positive. But as we collected that data, the fundamental architecture of of big data systems, you know, hyperscale data systems, is the idea that you have this sort of append only file storage system, which is the idea that you just constantly add to the add to the storage, and you can go back and analyze that data later. But it really isn't built into that foundational architecture that you would ever go back and delete it. And the 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 fundamental architecture of the systems actually makes that that type of selective deletion very difficult. And so it, during the process of many companies becoming GDPR compliant, there were massive engineering efforts that went that went on to re-engineer those systems so that you could selectively delete the data uh, that for someone say for example during a GDPR data subject request. Yeah, and you know the the, the to that end, there are a lot of of, of companies decided. You know, I got a lot of data. I don't know what to to to, to delete, uh, but it's encrypted. We should be fine. In a, in a post quantum world, that's that 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 uh, safety net is going to completely come unraveled. Yeah. Well, I think that you have to you, again I, as a security person. I think you you typically think of in layer in layers of defense, and so obviously encryption is one of those layers. Asymmetric encryption algorithms are going to be more susceptible to the types of attacks that we see in a post quantum world than you know, high key length symmetric ciphers like bulk encryption and AES. So the the security of one's key management system will be is is subject to some interpretation depending on how people uh, implement it, but. It's always critical that you you physically delete the data on the other side of that, whether that's you know physically erasing the devices themselves or erasing the logical storage. If you're in a you know public cloud context, you know making sure that that data is fully destroyed before before you move on and uh, you know give up your obligation to as the as the custodian of that data uh, for your customers. Yeah, and, and let me shift to to Maurice. Maurice, how how do you think enterprises get a handle on the excess data that's flowing throughout their systems and ultimately how do they create a condition where they can knowingly deliberately and completely erase the stuff that ought to be erased yeah this is no easy task for all the reasons that uh, jim already mentioned and the fact that we are uh, creating data at a rate that far exceeds uh, our current ability to, to identify it, to track it and tag it, and then ultimately delete it. And so it is a, an increasing problem that is getting for, uh, harder and harder to, to handle. I think one step is to recognize that, uh, and I think Jim was making this point earlier, so I'm underscoring this point, that when we look at data security, it's often interchangeable for good reasons with cybersecurity. But a lot of what happens in cybersecurity is focused on the environment in which the data is being created, processed, transmitted, stored, et cetera. So the, the focus tends to be on securing the physical infrastructure, securing endpoints, securing connections, uh, ensuring secure access and so forth. Those are certainly very important security controls that support data security. But understanding that data in many ways is sort of an abstraction layer above uh, the, the underlying infrastructure and that it is moving uh, very fluidly throughout. So of course there's data on, a, on an endpoint device, but it may very well be synced to a cloud hosted uh, storage account. 
Uh, there is data that is being created and processed in temporary virtual machines or containers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the enterprise needs to be able to take an approach to data security that looks at the entire data life cycle uh, sort of in its, it, as its own thing, uh, identify where it is, uh, seek to implement data security and data governance related controls as early in the process of data creation as possible so that it is more manageable later, much, much harder to try to uh, sort, tag, and, and manage data uh, once it's sort of been created, uh, and then manage the attack surface, meaning uh, of data, not just uh, the infrastructure. When we use the term attack surface, typically we refer, we're referring to physical in infrastructure. Sometimes we sort of talk about humans involved in the process, uh, but the data itself uh, has its own attack surface, and being able to reduce that is key. Uh, and that is a combination of both properly disposing of and sanitizing the data that is identified on devices, as well as understanding, uh, tracking, and then properly sanitizing the, the data that is in uh, more virtual environments, right? Where it needs to be erased in a live environment. You're not necessarily wiping an entire drive, but it may just be a file or, file or folder. Well, well said, and it, it triggers another thought that I'll, I'll turn to, to Jim, and that is this, this uh, notion of a continuum of uh, erasure responsibilities um, that starts when the data is created and perhaps ends at the end of an infrastructure's life. Uh, and there are some, some pretty messy considerations associated with you know, being a part of the circular economy uh, and deciding whether or not a physical destruction of IT infrastructure is right for a business. Jim, could you give us your, your thoughts on that? Well, I think that you know, you, you have this tension, and I think this tension is growing between the the so the absolute certainty of the physical destruction uh, with the the social responsibility, environmental responsibility that's that you know that we all feel today with with the the protection of our planet. How do we how do we get those same level of guarantees uh, in a much more uh, environmentally socially responsible way? And I think that that there there in some ways you know we think about security as often performance or uh, or availability. There's trade offs between security and performance, for example. You know, in this case, you know, there's there's a trade off between the environment and 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 some aspect of the way the security control needs to be implemented. And I think we've seen a lot of investments over the last certainly five years to try to make that a lot better, give us better guarantees while at the same time uh, having less environmental impact from the physical destruction side of things. Yeah, and you know, uh, you, you had commented on uh, your uh, storied career in and around security. As, as chief trust officer of Salesforce, um, that sounds to me like it's such a powerful role that you could unilaterally define and decide, you know, how uh, uh, you know uh, data management, retention, and security was going to happen. You didn't need a team to, you know, make any of those decisions. I'm kidding. Talk to me a little bit about the team sport that is required to actually achieve a more uh, through collaboration achieve decidedly better outcomes for the organization. Yeah, I think there's two aspects to that. You know, as as a chief trust officer or a CISO, I think the most important thing we have to remember is our people are our biggest asset in our security program. And so embracing the entire community and the organization and help, having them help you uh, you know, enable and, and be successful in your security program. Like any CISO out there, you know, you need to take that type of approach. That's how you're going to be the most max, maximally successful. But at the executive level, uh, this is also a team sport. And it's, it's, you know, with especially as Maurice was talking about the separation of data from the infrastructure and the complexity of all these applications, many of which are departmentally managed and controlled. The, the organization, the, the players in an organization that are involved in a data life cycle, you know, everyone from your general counsel to your chief product officer to, you know, the people in the finance organization who are doing F, uh, FP, you know, FP&A and, and, and uh, data analytics um, and your data protection officer, who, which might sit in various parts of the company, along with your CIO, CTO and your CISO. And, it, and the important thing is that you bring all of those capabilities together, whether you have discrete roles for all those people or not. Not, and everybody works together to define that policy. I think the most important policies are set 
uh, in a way that's mutually agreed across all the stakeholders. Um, and that that will lead to the best outcome uh, for your company in the long run. And and uh, Maurice, despite that collaboration uh, and uh, the seemingly impenetrable perimeter defenses uh, that are, are set up for many enterprises, you know, uh, bad people still get in. Um, and it, it's it's the reason why, at a minimum, uh, redundant, obsolete, trivial data uh, that uh, it shouldn't be in the enterprise to begin with needs to be removed and removed at the time, uh, you know, where it, it, it's potentially most dangerous to the firm. Uh, talk a little bit about, you know, this this whole notion of not only right access at the right time for the right duration, uh, but, you know, what, what kind of conditions need to be put in place for enterprises to make the decision around removing data, you know, n not just, you know, uh, copying it and backing it up? Well, certainly a lot of that is driven by uh, regulatory requirements, uh, particularly around privacy. So uh, the right of data subjects uh, to be uh, to be forgotten. And I put air quotes around that because it's uh, not the actual term that's used, but the ability for someone to have their uh, personally identifi identifiable information uh, erased is an important part of, of that con uh, those constructs. Uh, so that requires some very specific processes, and in many cases, re-architecting, to underscore one of Jim's earlier points, uh, the process by which data is managed so that it can, in fact, be identified, collected, contained, so that then proper sanitization can occur. Uh, there are, of course, uh, internal security requirements, right, that are separate from sort of the uh, the external regulatory environment and could include the need or the imperative to protect proprietary confidential information, classified data uh, in, uh, in, in government uh, environments and so forth. That all requires a similarly disciplined process, uh, but it's hard to do uh, when you have uh, a lot of noise in the data environment. So being able to, at the same time that you're applying some very specific controls over specific types of data, uh, you need to be able to, to uh, reduce, again, the data attack surface by managing that, uh, that raw data, right? Redundant, obsolete, trivial data. And all too often, there are some assumptions that have gone into data that are not helping us here, right? One assumption is that sort of the more, is, the more data, the better, that sooner or later, there's the ability to mine value out of that data. And so there's a tendency for organizations to sort of hoard data, which leads to the second assumption that uh, cheap, uh, reliable, uh, and accessible data is the sort of norm indefinitely. Uh, and there are good reasons to believe that, but the costs will mount sooner or later. And then finally, that that it's uh, sort of secure uh, because of encryption and, and, uh, and, and notwithstanding Jim's uh, uh, sort of additional nuances that he added to the encryption question you posed earlier, there is a there is a concern right, that in a post quantum world, that many of the uh, the default encryption that is used for that data uh, may no longer be as reliable as we would like to think that it is, and yeah. that requires reducing data in general to a much more manageable uh, quantity to be uh, kind of overall at the same time the very specific controls that are applied to certain types of data. Yeah, you know, we got a really timely question from one of the audience uh, members, um, and it reads, speaking of compliance, uh, what form of evidence should I use to show data was securely deleted? Uh, Maurice, Jim, you want to comment on that? I think we've, we've got an opinion at Blanco for sure. Yeah, certainly happy to address that. I think it's important that, uh, that you have the ability to demonstrate that data was erased to a particular standard. Uh, meaning that a technical standard that is reliable and acceptable uh, by the rest of the world. So there are standards uh, from a variety of different standards bodies. The most common and, and arguably the most sort of popular these days is NIST. Special Publication 800-88 uh, for, for media sanitization is the primary one. Uh, but whatever the standard is, you need to understand what the standard was you need to be able to have a third party verification or at least a third software verification and then have a report that you can have confidence in, meaning that it is a visually signed certificate of erasure that uh, gives you the assurance that not only was it done, uh, but then you have sort of a complete story of what was done to what data on what device and so forth. Yeah, thank you for that. 
um, and way, way more uh, on that topic available uh, as needed for, for the audience uh, after this, uh, this webinar. I, I want to uh, touch a little bit on regulation. And uh, you have to be kind of living under a rock not to see uh, in the news in, in increasingly high stakes manners um, folks that are, are exposing their customers' data and therefore their company to great risk, brand risk, uh, as well as financial risk. Jim, can you comment on how, in, in your mind, you've seen regulations over the last, you know, maybe five to seven years get more and more teeth where it's forcing companies into, you know, a non-benign posture, a lean-in kind of posture around solving some of these problems. Can you t t share with the audience a little bit about what's happened the last five to seven years and what you expect in terms of the future in terms of regular regulatory pressures. Sure, I think that I think that things stepped up. You know, there's always been regulation and 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 once uh, one area or another, especially in particular industries. But I think you saw we saw a, a pretty significant shift in the world with GDPR, um, not just because of the specificity of what you need to do, but also because of the 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 teeth, the the fines, the potential fines associated with the uh, uh, with that being uh, material, and so. And, and so I think a lot of companies, spent, you know, not just European companies, but global companies spent a lot of energy uh, to uh, attain compliance, which, you know, I think sets up uh, sets up the world for a, a, a more protected place. Um, and now we're starting to see, you know, the the regulatory appetite to expand uh, on that with with things. And while it's sector specific, you know, the Digital Online Resilience Act in, in the EU, which brings an, another layer of controls, including things like availability uh, to the you know incident disclosure to the uh, to the table with with similarly uh, structured fines. And so I think that um, I think that there's going to be more and more regulatory pressure worldwide. You know, obviously the EU is, is leading in this space right now, but because of the way those the regulations are written, they typically impact worldwide companies uh, in addition to European companies. But also, I think we'll see small uh, other regions, you know, APAC and eventually the United States pick up regulation in this space as well. Um, and so I think it's best to always be prepared um, and invest and make the investments in the data lifecycle early uh, so that you can not only be compliant with these uh, regulations, but also really help your business accelerate um, by better utilization of the of the critical data you have. You know, Maurice talked about, you know, at collecting all of the data and hoarding it. I think the most important thing is how do you find the truly valuable data in your organization and then set it free so that it can actually help your business accelerate. Right. You know, to, to that end, uh, EU is almost a canary in the coal mine for the U.S., U.S. almost being proxy regulated by what the uh, EU is doing. A f fair statement? Yeah, I think a lot of U.S. companies did a lot of work for EU regulation, you know, including companies that were don't have a huge global footprint. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, Maurice, let's let's uh, shift a little bit to, um, you know, your, your commentary around attack surface. And it, it really is uh, knowing where the data is, being able to classify the data, and then being able to take action on it. Again, we, we've defined a fairly broad spectrum of, you know, the uh, data classification and and erasure marketplace. Comment on uh, if you could. Do you think it's best to try to tag data when it's created, or to go out into the wild and try to scrub infrastructure? Uh, uh, and and update that data from a classification point of view. What what's the current state of the state on technologies to allow companies to do those things? Well, the state of the state I think is um, uh, relatively dismal, and I say relatively because we don't want to to not uh, sort of appreciate the great work that is being done by security professionals regularly. Uh, but it is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, because of the volume of data, the manner in which data is created, uh, every single person in an enterprise is, is creating data uh, along with the, the machines, right, are also creating data, if nothing else, through, through log data constantly. Uh, so it is a very, very difficult uh, situation to get a handle on. There are some uh, good tech, uh, technology solutions out there for doing that, but it is very difficult to do. Um, so we should sort of, um, acknowledge the, the challenge here. It is definitely better and easier to manage data if it is properly tagged at the start. 
by far that's the best approach uh, if possible. But we also can't rely on that uh, once that's sort of uh, properly handled, right, with, uh, with uh, data classification solutions and so forth. Uh, there is still the need to scan the wild, if you will, in that just because you have some good uh, data governance controls on certain types of data created by certain users or on, in certain environments or on certain devices, uh, doesn't mean that there isn't also additional data that has been created or copied or otherwise moved sort of into less controlled environments uh, or more fluid environments that don't also need to be detected, discovered, and then sort of uh, wrestled to the ground, right, and properly tagged. And so yeah. there is a need really to do both. And, uh, and, it's, and it's very difficult to do uh, in a large enterprise environment, no doubt about it. Well, uh, Jim has led large enterprise environments for a lot of his career. Uh, could you could you uh, make a, a series of follow up comments on that question, Jim? Yeah, so 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 I totally agree that the the best practice is to tag this information up front. I think one of the important things to remember that. Uh, not all of the things you need to classify and track data are intrinsic to the data. There are external things like the version of the privacy policy language under which you collected the data. Um, and that needs to be associated with the data at time of collection so that later on you can understand the rights associated. There might be external contracts associated with data as well. And the, those contracts change over time. And so you might have one rights to data collected on day one and you know, day on a day a thousand, you have different rights associated with that data. And those are not things that you're ever gonna discover with an artificial intelligence data classification tool. Um, and so it's, it is important, as Marie said, to build a system as you're ingesting this data to keep track of both the intrinsic factors and the sort of externalities that, that govern what you can do with that data. And this is why even, you know, if you're, you know, a small company investing in data governance, at, you know, especially for your most critical data assets early, early in your life cycle, uh, re will will both reduce your risk, but more importantly, will enable your business to to take advantage of that data and 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 do the analytics or marketing or whatever other activities, product improvements that are driven by that data. Yeah, great. Listen, we've got three minutes left. We're gonna we're gonna uh, manage this to uh, to uh, uh, the planned uh, end time. But uh, there, there's two things I want to do in parallel with the the couple minutes I have left. I'd ask all of the attendees to use the chat to to share with us so we can share with others which regulations matter most uh, in your business and which are driving action around data sanitization uh, that you might need some help with. So tell us about the regulations that are are pre prevalent in your industries and the standards by which you think uh, it's appropriate to sanitize. While they're doing that and we're collecting that input, I do want to you know, just kind of mention this omnipresent condition in you know, facing everyone, and that's the cloud. And data sanitization challenges when you consider hybrid or public cloud implementations of, uh, uh, in your organization, to me, it, it might complicate the matter of making the decisions around how, to, how data gets sanitized. Jim, could you comment a little bit on, you know, for small companies and big companies alike, this whole aspect of introducing cloud technologies to an organization and how you handle the, the, the data sanitization and erase your challenges when you have a multi-cloud environment? Sure, I think that I think that you have to think about this again in layers. Uh, and I, I think when you think about SaaS or public, uh, infrastructure as a service, you're effectively delegating layers of your responsibility to a third party. And so there's sort of two aspects that I think are really important as you're moving to this this type of environment. One is to understand what aspects of this that you know we think of uh, cloud as a shared responsibility model. What aspects of this do you retain responsibility for, and what tools do you need to deploy on your side to make sure that the the data uh, erasure and sanitization is happening correctly? That might be purchasing a tool. That might be configuring an application to operate correctly on the tenant side. And then you actually have to take the time to go meet with your vendor, do the analysis of what their guarantees are in their contracts, um, because you're signing a contract with them to perform some duties that you historically on premise would have would have been responsible for. And your customers are still going to hold you accountable for that end to end delivery, which means you need to ensure that both technically uh, what your SaaS or IaaS provider is do doing to sanitize that data is uh, uh, meets the standards you're committing to, but also that you have the contractual controls in place to do something about it if things don't, don't, don't quite go the way uh, that, that they're specified to go. 
Fair guidance. Maurice, last word to you, my friend. I would say you can't, when it comes to data, you can't store it and forget it. Good yep. data governance and good data security means at some point you need a good data sanitization approach. Amen, amen. Gentlemen, this was great. We could spend hours on this topic and uh, these are our, uh, this webinar series is meant to uh, provide our, our guests and audience really, really crisp, hard hitting guidance on topics that take a, a considerable amount of time to uh, wrestle to the ground. I, I hope uh, to the audience that this uh, discussion has been thought provoking. Uh, I hope uh, it will trigger some new investigation and research on your behalf. Uh, we stand ready to support you however we can in evaluating the technologies, the best practices, the partnerships that might help you get to your end game. Uh, but for now, uh, I wanna thank you for your kind attention. Jim and Maurice, very, very well done. Uh, and we'll see you out in, uh, in, in the cyber world. Best wishes, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.